this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Patreon is a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the handle, The Beirut Banyan. And you can find us on our YouTube channel with the same name. And you can start watching the episodes as they're released. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. I'm Rani Shatah. And this is The Beirut Banyan. life is quite tense at the moment in Beirut and Lebanon and I think most people when their job is to report on the stress that we're going through they look forward to winding down in the evening and taking it easy then instead of winding down and taking it easy you get stressed out by someone like me so it means a lot it means a lot that you're staying awake uh, it means a lot that as someone who's reporting on current events that you're happy to sort of reflect with me on what we're going through. And uh, I'll just start off by saying that it's quite fitting maybe that just before we started recording, you know, I asked you how long have you been at the Daily Star? And you said one year, roughly one year to be exact. And uh, yep. what a year. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the craziest, craziest year been non-stop. I'm going to guess you haven't slept well recently as a result of your <laughs> job and yeah. your where, where you are and all that's happened. You know, I try not to complain from my side. I've been in New York since January, but even covering events there from here, I stay up late at night. I'm, I'm often yeah. stressed, even if it's not impacting me physically here. But mm -hmm. my thoughts are going all the time back to Beirut and anyone I care for there. So mm -hmm. I, I admire the work you're doing and the output. You know, I, um, I, I assumed wrongly that your, your uh, pieces come out on a weekly basis, but I kind of looked back recently. It's more than that, especially the last two weeks. I think I saw, mm -hmm. I saw three, three pieces sort of back to back. And the three mm -hmm. pieces kind of tackle all that's happening at the moment. So it's kind of a, it's a perfect starting point. And instead of going back to last August or last September, when you started reporting, um, we'll kind of, maybe we can go back in time from today towards October 17, mm -hmm. by, by reflecting on these pieces. And, and the most recent one, and we can start off here because I think it's the most, uh, it's the most pertinent, it's the most present uh, story. It's Lebanese surprised, disappointed by STL verdict. Mm -hmm. Now I thank you in advance for sending me the, uh, the, uh, the password to get full access to the Daily Star without paying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I I navigate different ways to read these articles. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I, I have to admit, I haven't paid recently. <laughs> so I should say uh -huh. this as a disclaimer. But anyone listening and watching, it, you should. It's just I, uh, yes, please, I kind we of... Need it. It's been a while I haven't, yeah. So I'll emphasize it's important. But let's start there. Let's start with the STL and the verdict. And in a way, these are the two words that resonate with me, even though they're differing opinions, and maybe they're, but, but in a way they overlap too, that there is a bit of, there is disappointment. And there's also, I think, maybe the surprise is born out of the disappointment too, that people were expecting mm -hmm. something different. And the surprise is not one out of sort of, it's not magnitude, it's sort of like a def deflation. It's almost mm -hmm. that, um, the end was not sort of, uh, it wasn't poetic in any way. It was almost a, a blip and it, it passed yeah. sort of, uh, it passed without much uh, happening. So let's start there. Uh, as a reporter and maybe as somebody, I think who's largely grown up in those years, the, you know, the post 2000 events and then 2005, the assassination that the steel is all about and the string of assassinations that happened surrounding that one and the ones that happened later. Uh, do you get, do you sense that the disappointment or maybe the emotional dissatisfaction is outweighed 
by the 2,600 page report. So in other words, that despite your feelings and despite your maybe disillusion as, as a citizen, that maybe at the end of the day, what matters is that some quote truth came out and that there's facts mm -hmm. that now people can use and maybe over time, it'll be left to historians maybe to look back at this sort of time frame. That it, is the value still in the judgment, in the verdict? Or, or is it actually not that way, that the emotions are justified and they actually outweigh the verdict itself? And that's in a way maybe adding to the long-term pain of modern Lebanese history. So I'd like to just gauge your mind on that as somebody reporting on recent events and somebody who's grown up in the aftermath of all that's happened and what the STL is sort of uh, addressing. Mm -hmm. So I think the general, I mean, everyone expected this huge revelation during the verdict, the judgment announcement, and everyone expected there to be a sort of reaction you know, after the verdict was announced, you know, everyone expected something. And mm. I mean, it was postponed before, after the blast. So it was leading up. I mean, people were expecting something big to happen, but nothing happened. And they were, they were expecting, we all know this, everyone was expecting for a certain group to be blamed. But the yeah. thing is that people who know the tribunal and who know um, their rules of procedure were not surprised. They know that they can only find an individual guilty they can't find a government or a group guilty um they know that they didn't have enough evidence i mean the tribunal was established four years after the assassination i mean right. all of yeah. these things um you know come into play and then my general um i mean what i felt was that the people's disappointment kind of I mean, I don't want to say it, but it did outweigh mm, the mm. verdict. That's what I, I mean, that's what I felt personally. Um, by talking to so many people, social media, everyone was just surprised. They were like, oh, 15 years, $1 billion, and this is what they come up with? Oh, it, it's just this one guy who, you know, planned this, executed all of this. And yeah, and I... I mean, some people did find closure, of course. Others were disappointed, and some were, you know, happy with the verdict. We all know that. So, could you maybe yeah. go, let's go deeper into the disappointment in your conversations, mm -hmm. your reporting, your experience? Is the disappointment more more cosmetic? So, in other words, what you just said right now is that only one individual, only one name, is mm -hmm. being associated with this verdict. Even though the report sort of tells the whole backstory, and you're right that the STL was never designed to tackle groups or organizations. It was just uh, individuals. And they, they listed one. Is that where the disappointment is? That it's one name who's not on trial. And it's a it's sort of a, a trial in absentia in itself sort of mm -hmm. cools things down to a point that it's, it's almost like uh, an irrelevant... I don't want to say this without sounding too harsh, but it comes across emotionally as lacking justice as opposed to mm -hmm, delivering mm -hmm. justice. Is there, is there anything there in, in your conversations? So I don't think if it's, it didn't matter if that it was just one, if they found mm -hmm. all four guilty people were still going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. They would still mm -hmm. say, Oh, only four people, only eight people. How is that even possible? Right. So I don't think it's just that one name. I think people were expecting something bigger. Mm -hmm and more dramatic, but I think it's in everyone's interest. I mean, Lebanon, the last thing Lebanon needed was instability on top of everything that's happening. So I don't know why people were disappointed, if you know what I mean. So it's not disappointment in the verdict, it's disappointment in the foundation of the tribunal itself. That the, that the because I'm trying to get at why I felt also that way. Even though, mm -hmm. even though there's a, there is a conclusion. So. I mean, since you've probably spoken to more people about this subject, is it that the STL itself was not designed to go further? Is that the disappointment, that it's a decision sort of born out of a very long process that started in, 2000, in 2006 with the investigation, uh, 2005, 2006? Does it go back there? 
or is it more of that we were still expecting a bigger splash, a bigger sort of uh, finale that that wasn't meant mm -hmm. to be there? Yeah, so I mean, some people don't really know the details about STL. They don't know anything. They, just, they were just expecting this one big dramatic verdict. Mm. Others knew. Mm. So it's different, but um, it's just the disappointment is in the verdict itself. And other people were saying, oh, the STL was, this was bound to happen. It was the moment they created the tribunal and they set the rules of procedure and how, you know, they work. It, it was bound to, I mean, this was the verdict that they were expecting anyways. I mean, mm -hmm. we have, mm -hmm. you have four people, five people originally, you know, accused. So, I mean, what were you expecting anyway? So I think it just comes down to how much people knew about the whole case and its details. I think that's the main, you know. Who, who's messaging us during this conversation? And who oh, I'm so sorry about that. No, no, I'm that. kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just, saying we should, we should call them and see what's going on. Put them, put them on the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have an opinion on the STL. That that'd be funny. So, so by the way, what do you think? <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just teasing. Uh, so so in that sense, in that sense, the disappointment may not be justified. That there's a sort of an incorrect yes. incorrect emotion given that the STL at the end of the day stuck to the facts, gave us a report, and we can do what we can seek we can try to find some form of accountability based on that, that it's not meant to do yeah, much so more. I, yeah, so it just comes down to the person, how they see it. Mm. But I just think the whole thing was, it was a big event, 2005 assassination was such a huge, you know, event that fifth, you know, waited 15 years. So I guess because of the gravity of the event, plus the amount of years we waited, combined people were expecting something more but what were they expecting you know besides the i mean what were they expecting that's my question mm -hmm. if they you know if they knew about the court itself you know i'm just but let's go there you know what you bring up a good point and these are conversations i've had in private about the uh, the longevity of the investigation and the tribunal that 15 years is quite a long time so is mm -hmm. that, I mean, because you're, you're, in a way, you're... Technically 11 years, um, 2009. Yes, you know, you're right. It's, but even then, the, the investigation was long, too. So it's even, yeah. Um, yeah, so the whole thing, I mean, the whole time frame is taxing on a population. But, but you're bringing up a good point, which is, what did they expect? N let me ask you, as somebody who's covering it and somebody who's lived through it, what, what were you expecting? Were you expecting this conclusion as somebody, as a citizen living in a country going through all the pain at the moment? Was it mm -hmm. even, was it, is that, is that part of it? That you were not, you're not, sim <laughs> you're not able to care more because things have changed so much since then and time, mm -hmm. time in a way factors in naturally. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to the early part, which is you just started being a reporter a year ago. This year alone is enough mm. for any country's history. <laughs> At least yeah, it's, exactly. it's it's modern history. So, it, do all these things kind of play into the dissatisfaction of people, ordinary people? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound insensitive, but it does. Besides the time frame, it's just I don't know. I I guess because everything is so dramatic and. In Lebanon, they were expecting this to have a dramatic ending. I guess that was the disappointment, you know. A lot yeah. of people don't really know that much anyways. They were just, oh, yeah, the verdict, STL, yeah, let's see. Oh, my God, they just accused this one individual. That's it. You know, not that many people looked very deep into it, and they were expecting something dramatic. And, you know, for one week, there were so many fake news, fake voice messages being mm -hmm. circulated on mm -hmm. WhatsApp. Something big is going to happen, something. And I was telling people just to, you know, stop spreading these psychic or whatever <laughs> predictions and psychic I politics. guess that also um, play the role because we forget that there are different types of people who get who are influenced by different but by whatever they read by whatever they hear and so maybe that also played into the mm. to their expectations of this verdict you know these whatsapp messages you know it's funny I you mentioned this earlier, prior to the blasts, the verdict was meant to be issued two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And there was already enough tension in the air 
remove the blasts completely, aside from the blasts, yeah. that things were already escalating and, and horrible. So yeah, I think I think the blasts may have, t in a way, justifiably taken the story in a different direction. But that kind of links to another topic that I wanted to get in uh, to, to address with you, and it goes to the second piece, the second most recent piece. Uh, Lebanon PM Dieb government resigns in wake of Beirut blasts. This is a maybe a more personal perspective, but um, I think it kind of ties in to the reporting and to the protests and eventually to the blasts. Do you think there's a wider story of accountability at play? Meaning that you have protesters who rush to Martyrs Square in downtown Beirut just days after the blasts happened. Morning, maybe one or two days, and then by the third day that, I mean, towards the weekend after the blasts, you have protests returning. And protests have mm -hmm. been a feature since you've sort of started reporting since last October. Is there a thread there that it's the same kind of demand, even though the crime is different, even though it's not a political assassination, it's a, it's an enemy. Ammonium nitrate explosion. These are not the same kind of crime, but the fact is blasts happen people die There's material damage and of course the the blasts at the port are far more dramatic than Hadidi's assassination But that's just relative. It's because they were so mm -hmm. Horrific the, the the port blast was so intense that it kind of puts other assassinations in a Unfortunately in a, in a perspective yeah. at least in terms of yeah. damage but is that, is that there, that you have a long story of accountability and that, yes, the verdict did not sort of deliver an emotional, uh, it did not deliver a, a rewarding finale, but the story is still at play, that there are still mm -hmm. people demanding some form of justice, even when the crimes are not necessarily the same. Do you sense that? From the conversations, from your reporting, and, and from your own sort of, your own life in Beirut. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you mean if there, if the blast brought back the same demand of accountability? Is that what you mean? Well, or just justice in general? That I mean, do, do you think that there's a long story of accountability that brings these two events together? Or are they separate chapters? Maybe that's a better way of asking the question, that mm. it's different types of accountability, let's say. Or yes, maybe, exactly. Yeah. It's different types. Mm. But the fact that they were, I mean, the blast happened and then we had the verdict, it brought back the same conversation, the same demand for accountability. And I think this was one example. See, people drew comparisons. They were they were saying, oh, see what an international investigation led up to. It's not even satisfactory it took so many years right. do you want the same thing to happen yeah. to the beirut blast uh, investigation if it goes international um yeah. people started to draw um draw up comparisons and then they also said um this is we got justice and this is the first step so next we have to get justice for the beirut blast right so i guess this is how these two they are very different types of um demands for accountability but i guess this is type sort of, you know, leading the way for other types of, you know, cases or investigations to bear fruit. And in, in, the, in the demands, do you sense that there's also a, mm -hmm. a more, a, let's say it's an easier demand when it comes to the Beirut blasts in, in the port, and that this is not a political assassination, this is literally a, a homegrown disaster. That, do you uh -huh. sense it's sort of a, it's a narrative that takes hold maybe more quickly than an assassination would, even if the assassination yes. brings a lot of damage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, definitely, because mm. this was on a whole of other scale, other different magnitude. But the thing is that from the reaction of the political class, I really don't see how this investigation will be that different from you know, other investigations, or if we will see a, or maybe this investigation will also, its verdict or its judgment will also be dissatisfactory for the Lebanese people, because we know what the Lebanese people want. They want from the highest 
um, official to the you know most junior official all to be held accountable. But I don't see how that's going to be happening. And if more junior people are held accountable, people are still not going to be satisfied. They want everyone held accountable. Because this blast illustrates what's wrong with Lebanon. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect, perfect example to show what is wrong in our system, which we all know what it is, you know, corruption, sectarian system leading to a, you know, leading to a failed state. So, um, Demanding justice, um, demanding for there to be justice for this blast is very closely tied to what the October 17 protests, to all what all of these protests are demanding, which is an overhaul of the system. I think it's tied to that, definitely. That's actually a nice segue into something that just crossed my mind. You mentioned a, a mid-level arrest or somebody who's not high up on the on the ladder being accused and then thrown in jail, that would not be a satisfactory conclusion. Do you get, I mean, and I'm throwing this out there, is that the same kind of emotion when we saw a mid-level member of an organization accused for an assassination rather than something that's more up this up the ladder? That there's a, not, that it wasn't the bigger sort of, uh, you would expect Fish. more. Yeah, exactly. Is that is that a similar kind of uh, expression? Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say yes. Mm. I think yes. Okay. People are were expecting more, and by more, I guess we mean you well, know, higher up. It could, yeah, and also maybe more, more, maybe more familiar names that that people. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, the port blast where there's plenty of names that you can sort of accuse, yes. I suppose, and then only mm -hmm. sort of the lower level uh, bureaucrats or let's say administrators are the ones that are being accused. Yes. You're careful with words. I should learn from this. In the in the 207 <laughs> episodes, this is the first time that I think uh, I'm the one who's talking more. <laughs> I should learn from you. You're concise. <laughs> Maybe I should shorten the episodes. <laughs> or I should have a special feature with Bushik. Two minutes, we get it all. All is said. Okay, I'm and I'm 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 repeatedly teasing you, so don't don't take this seriously. No, so, no. Yeah, this topic, I think, naturally goes back to an earlier piece that was released just four days after the explosion, Judgment Day, which I, I like yeah. that, Judgment Day, and it's a bit in quotes, I, I, I said appropriately. Thousands demand justice for Beirut blast. You know, that kind of headline, I think, can exist at any different period in modern Lebanese history, and we would not know what it's referring to. Unfortunately. That's a sad yeah. sort of reminder, just how abnormal things are. That said, um, this is a massive explosion that got the world's attention. Mm -hmm. The port is unrecognizable. Um, I mean, neighborhoods that both of us, I think, think of as home or associate ourselves with are permanently scarred. And uh, mm -hmm. let alone the human cost of this disaster. The Hadidi assassination, as a sort of, it's more obvious now with the STL's uh, report, that little summary that I was able to skim, um, is that there was state mismanagement and deliberately done to sort of uh, tamper with evidence. And I think all of us kind of assumed that anyway that we would be very surprised if there was a sort of a protect that site, don't touch it, let the investigators do their job. So now it's clear that that didn't happen 15 and a half years ago. Now, with something that is horrific and a mushroom cloud sort of dominating the story, this is a horrible image anyway, and the world, the world witnessed a, one of the most, one of the most stunning uh, disasters uh, in modern history. Do you think that an international investigation is guaranteed? And do you think at the end of the day that is something beneficial? Meaning, would you rather, and I ask you as both a reporter and as a citizen, so I mean feel free to go any direction you'd like here, a personal level and a professional level. Is there any uh, argument where an international investigation will continue 
to prevent the state from doing its job. And I say this carefully, knowing that the state in its current capacity is not the kind of state you would want to handle that kind of investigation. So I, and mm -hmm. meaning that is there, is there, hmm, are we left with only an invest, an international investigation that could maybe point at what happened and offer us answers? Or is that sort of dismissal of it? Is that too sort of, uh, to maybe local Lebanese politics where there are people trying to protect their names and maybe mm -hmm. they, they don't want to get uh, accused and therefore they, they you know, dismiss international investigations. And then they point to the STL saying, look at a billion dollars and you get only one name. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm trying yeah. to find sort of, uh, I'm trying to find a calibration there that is there only one option really at the, at the end of the day, that it's an international team that will have to do this for us. Um, at least in, in the sense see, the of justice, is, when, when the demands for yeah. justice and towards that angle. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we all know our judiciary is not independent. So if we don't have an independent judiciary, how are we even expecting there to be complete justice? It's just unrealistic. So I personally don't have trust. In the investigations i mean we also i mean even by appointing a lead investigator they had to go through so many names and haggle over the yeah. names this is the relative of this person that's the <laughs> that's and true. so even with that um i mean just by appointing the lead investigator they showed a type of not incompetence but i just it just rubbed me the wrong way just, they just started this i mean not with not the best way. So I wouldn't say I want a complete international investigation. I'm not an expert on these, but I would say if there's sort of a mix, mm. I mean, I would be on board with that. I know there are French experts helping the, I mean, David Hale said FBI is going to be helping yeah. with the um, investigations. So with international components involved, I guess that would um, comfort some people who have zero trust in the state. But at the end of the day, it's Lebanese judges, um, you know, on the case. So I mm, mm. don't have complete trust in that. No one does. So in other words, a hybrid-like situation similar yes. to the similar to yeah. the tribunal, in that you'd have both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that even with that massive disappointment, that's the only toolkit. That's the only tool in the toolkit that we have which is that's the yes. that's really the only way right. yeah but i would be extremely disappointed if we had to wait 15 years to have one name yeah us. yeah and i don't think most of us are capable of living long enough to see justice <laughs> over three decades for two incident for two attacks so that yeah. i mean time is not on anyone's side they find this the perfect um incident or event to you know renew their demands of yeah. removing the entire political class but i'm not seeing any i didn't see a big a great mobilization we saw thousands of people on saturday two weeks ago after the blast it was a big protest yeah. but i was expecting more i was expecting much more because what mobilized people what enraged people this time is nothing compared to what drew them to the streets on october 17. Right. on october 17 we hadn't lived through all of this chaos yeah. Even without the blast, they, the streets, I mean, people should have been on the streets. But now even with the blast, I'm still waiting. I'm waiting for, you know, to see people on the streets because, because there is international pressure, international attention on this issue, on the investigations. But I guess local pressure will also maybe help speed things up with the investigations. That's a nice way of bringing it back to October. October 17. And you're absolutely right. I mean, things have only gotten worse since then. Much and worse. Much worse. And we have, just like you said, we have many more reasons to be sort of demanding a better future for Lebanon today than we did in October 16. And October 16, 2019 was already unbearable. So that mm -hmm. that's a healthy way of kind of showing the bigger picture here that said i share the i share the same sentiment in that and i kind of had this conversation with different guests on the podcast i was expecting more 
Not necessarily, it, only, only for the simple reason that I really thought this kind of dramatic explosion that has such a huge toll on, on everyone associated with Lebanon, that I thought that in, that in itself would take, you would see more symbolic changes happening. Actually, I, 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 and I, I got it wrong. I really thought that you would have uh, more anger and, a, and mm-hmm. a, a more collective anger at the, uh, and you'd have more resignations as a result. And that kind that did surprise me. I, I really thought yes. that, yeah, that it's, it's, it surprised me and <laughs> it's kind of going back to the earlier article, surprised and disappointed me that it's mm-hmm. uh, because yeah, you, you would want to see people in power step down as a result of that mismanagement for all the reasons mm-hmm. and we don't need to go into them, but just for all, everything that went wrong, that went wrong, <laughs> culminating in those blasts, you would expect at least a dozen uh, individuals, leadership positions yeah. to, to sort of resign on the spot. But that didn't happen. So and that, it's not just about not delivering what the people want. You know, in other countries, a politician will step down if people are not happy with their policies. But this was a crime. It was a huge, yes. huge, I mean, it was, it's a yes. crime. It's not even about policy. It's not even about performance. It's a crime. I mean, it's very surprising how little resignations we saw. Yeah. After. Oh, I mean, um, this is a big question to throw on you. Are you able to sort of step back and reflect on that and offer maybe any assumptions as to why this didn't happen? Because I, I... The resignation? No, the... Well, what you just said, a crime of that scale and then leadership not resigning and, and perhaps on the other side, protesters unable to force that. So do you have any mm-hmm. perspective on that? Why, why it's not... Uh, why it doesn't seem to be in the cards? So for the resignation, the thing is the people in power will do every single, every last, you know, they will go to the last resort. They will deplete all of their options until to cling to power. So the blast happened. I'm sure they were, I mean, I don't know how it happened. We don't know the real. We don't know the truth. But that still didn't shake them. And then when they saw that the protests kind of, they weren't as big as what we saw previously, and then Mm, they kind of mm. died down. It really didn't just, and other politicians are saying, oh, if we leave, what's the alternative? Lebanon cannot be in vacuum again. We can't afford vacuum right now. You know, you have all of these uh, statements by people you know, their reasoning behind not resigning. And it's again, it goes back to these people are have been in power for 30 years. They're yeah. going to try and stay in power as long as they can. And for the people, I really don't know why there, we haven't seen a lot of protests. I, maybe they're just mentally drained, physically drained. Yeah. Uh, I guess that definitely plays into it. They don't have the same energy as back like they did in October. Right. But they do have, people are demanding this. I'm seeing it on social media. I'm just not seeing it translate to the streets. But I can't tell you that what the definite you know, answer is for people not mobilizing. But for the political class, that's, you know. So that's, so in other words, the, there's been so many things that have taken their toll anyway on the population that there's the effort to actually do this would be too much that people don't have the capacity right now because they're suffering for mm-hmm. for well, many reasons yeah and they have other concerns you know because the economic situation is so bad people are thinking about what's going to happen yeah. next should i move should i you know all of these things coronavirus you know we ha- you have so right. many reasons so i couldn't pinpoint to what the exact reason is but that's your job Bushik. this is why it's not kidding okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I expect one answer. <laughs> no, uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. There is another uh, topic which I'm not too familiar with. I've been reading about it. The sort of the current crisis related to subsidies, and uh, it seems to be that this is a very, very sort of well. There's pressure, I guess, on the population. And this is coming from the central bank. And is it three months of 
were three months left before those subsidies yeah. expire? That's what the central bank mm. is saying. Can, can you maybe, I mean, yeah. we just found this out today. I mean, this is long overdue. If you ask some people, they will say, oh my God, finally, they're lifting the subsidies. But if you ask the population, just general population, everyone is panicking. Everyone is very um, concerned because we already have crazy high prices for basic commodities. And now we have fuel, we medicine, um, the central bank is saying it doesn't have enough reserve to sustain the subsidy for more than three months. And they've been subsidizing these products for more than 20 years. You know, Lebanese people are used to living with these subsidies. And now they're going to be lifted off at a time when everyone is very vulnerable. So I think, but I would say, I mean, I know if someone, if I tell someone, oh, but you should be not happy, but you should, it's a good step because the central bank was sustaining, it was paying for something it couldn't afford all these years. And um, economically, on the long run, it is going to help us because, I mean, I, this is what economists are saying, that it's going to stab help stabilize the Lebanese pound. So right. econom economists are saying, would you rather have affordable fuel bread and uh, exchange rate of 15,000 or would you rather have 4,000 but a, a bit sorry 15,000 or 1,500 the old exchange rate no no I meant yeah what I meant was yeah. that if we go on this way if the central bank continues subsidizing mm -hmm. and no sound economic uh, policies and reforms are implemented the exchange rate will only go up it oh oh 15, even up to 15000 right right yeah, yeah. But by stopping the subsidies what they're saying or what's recommended is that the money goes to provide you know social um, safety nets for the vulnerable right so are those subsidies all still locked in at the old exchange rate yes so so i mean it was the only one remnant of the old peg right. the subsidies. Yeah. So now we, when they remove the subsidies, nothing will be at the one thousand five hundred rate anymore. So then it just officially expires in all in all sectors. It becomes a, yeah. a relic. Yeah. So I don't past. know if the central bank will officially announce. But then there's the question of will they put in a new peg or will they right. float the lira, which is another discussion and related to the IMF. In all of that, so is that being is that part of the negotiations floating the exchange rate again? Um, so, what do you mean again? That, sorry, sorry. That in other words, there would be an, a new peg. Is that even in the yeah. sort of? Oh, because the um, Diab government in their economic rescue plan, they did say that on the long run. I don't know next year or the one after that. Mm -hmm. They are going to float the Lebanese lira because that is what should have been done all these years mm, you know we mm. had the, the superficial peg all these years but it should have been and once it floats and the supply and demand you know forces determine you know all this economics determine the true you know quote unquote true value of the leader but right. the imf is also um it's their recommendation or i don't know if it's a demand to float the leader i see so point. so it happened to be one of those things that both sides agreed to to yes, the but I mean, mm. the government or, you know, the, yeah, the government was kind of not forced, but it was their only option at this point, you know, right, right. we're bankrupt, we're in debt, yeah. we can't sustain this peg anymore. So, I, I mean, the plan was praised by many because it was the first time an, an actual economic blueprint is being put in place. Right. And, yeah. you know, economists did welcome that the option of floating the currency, but yeah, we'll see. Can I ask you though, this is maybe more instinctual uh, question. Uh, do you think that's the only task the next government has, is to get an IMF negotiation done? No, definitely not. Yeah. But the IMF is a great way to, you know, to start implementing these reforms in various sec uh, mm, uh, mm. sectors, you know, because it's not just about the economy, it's about downsizing the public uh, sector, because, you know, they pay so many salaries, and there are so many commissions and committees that don't really do anything and it's just spending, spending, spending. So right. then they want us to reform the electricity sector. So the government, whoever will come into power, they do have a long list of reforms, but we're yet to see if they are actually going to implement because the Diab government didn't you know, implement anything. So that's the big question here. It's reforms, reforms, this is the key word. 
Right. Well, they, I guess, I mean, it's funny, reform, reform, and it's sort of, that's my whole life story in Lebanon, speaking about reform, reform, reform. But I guess it just, all the, all the more reason why it, it still matters, and doesn't, mm -hmm. time does not sort of solve anyone's uh, issues in Lebanon. We, this is the first time we speak, so I, I assume, as a Daily Star reporter, that you have some interaction with the office, the Daily Star office. And I, I saw mm -hmm. horrible images of the destruction, the damage done to the Daily Star. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm sorry to even ask you this, but were you, were you, where were you when the blast happened? Oh, I wasn't at the office. Okay. Where, where I was were not you? at the office. I was at home. And I honestly, if I was at work that day, because I would have left at six that day and I would have taken the road that, you know, by the port. So I don't even want to think what would have happened if I was at work, but I wasn't. And thankfully, no one was um, harmed at the office. It was just material damage. So. Do you live in Beirut? No, I was in Metin. No, no. In Metin. But did you, I'm yeah. guessing it was, you could hear it from, from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At first thought it was an earthquake. Then it was, Yeah. you know, we heard the explosion, but nothing really happened to me or my family, thankfully. But I wish, you know, she, and then I was awake till the next morning, so. No, but I'm I'm kind of asking this because it's I everyone I know has had some interaction with the with this blast, whether they mm -hmm. and it, stories like what you just said that they would have probably been on the highway at Charles Hello, mm -hmm. or that that's the route that they take and there was just for for one reason or the other they were not there, or they were in Jemaisi in Madam Khail and they're injured and they're in the hospital or they're mm -hmm. they're suffering. And their homes are sort of destroyed, so I think that's something. Many as many explosions, many attacks, even periods of war, but this is really one of those occasions that all of us kind of were shaken down to our core. That this impacted everyone that thinks or or feels something towards Lebanon, living there or not, and that to me should be the that that should be the end. Of the bad years and now we move into the good years it's almost like mm -hmm. uh end that end those years of tragedy with a, a huge tragedy but okay that's the price we pay for something better i remember the hadidi assassination i remember the uh the protests i remember all the other stuff that happened too but there was a sense back then that it's a price, and despite the repeated assassinations, despite state paralysis, despite even the July 2006 war, despite the May 2008 events, I mean, despite it all, there was still this lingering, things will get better. This is a period of transition. Mm -hmm. It turned out that that period of transition just brought us to where it we are. It was our life. Yeah, it brought us to where we are now, which is so much worse. And I know you're younger than me, and I know you just started reporting a year ago. Neither one of us are dinosaurs anyway, so that's uh, that's not really the point. But do you think that... In, can you see any silver lining that could give people maybe uh, some hope or some optimism that this is a tragedy and now... We're going through a stage where things will only get better long term, or is it still possible, at least at least from your side, that things could continue to get worse, and that we might actually end up in a failed state, failed economy, failed state, where crime is the norm, and it may not be a civil war, it may not be the 1980s, yeah. but it could be something that's ungovernable, unmanageable, and just a, a state that's simply dysfunctional. I mean, I I don't want to be pessimistic. I don't want to be a downer, but I have to say this, that I don't see it, that things will get better. I mean, how the blast was something so shocking, so devastating that I don't think any event will trump this one. Mm. So, yes, in a way you can say, yeah, I mean, things will get better because the blast is the lowest of the low. Mm. So, yes, it will get better, but not to me. I don't see it. I don't see how things will get better as long as we have, you know, the same type of system, the same people in power. And as long as I don't 
see it as Lebanon will, you know, be plunged into a state of chaos, crime is on the rise. It's on. I don't see that scenario. But if, you know, politicians don't don't put in place um, effective policies, you know, especially with the economy, they haven't been doing anything efficient this whole year. And we saw where that got us. You know, poverty, Esquire, just yesterday, they released new um, statistics. More than 50% yeah. of the population is in poverty. I mean, I don't know how worse it can get. So, but yeah. I personally don't see um, that the situation will get better anytime soon, at least. Let me ask you, though, and I mean, but, we can wrap it up here with, with this kind of a reflection. Again, I ask okay. you as a reporter, what are the conditions that need to be met now for there to be some positive change down the road? And I, and I mean, uh, is it, 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 and maybe I'll maybe frame it better. Do the answers lie with him that it's still up to the Lebanese to get Lebanon moving in the right direction? Or are the challenges, despite all effort, are the challenges beyond Lebanese control? That the Lebanese living in Lebanon can only do so much, but the regional dynamics are still in many ways the ultimate burden on bringing Lebanon into a better place. And you can say as much as you'd like about this. I know it's a huge sort of uh, way to end it, but I'm curious, mm -hmm. like, everyone's trying, everyone's suffering, uh, everyone's put an effort in, and we're only sort of slipping further and further. I don't want to say that it's not in the hands of the Lebanese to put the country on the right track. Because at the end of the day, it is the people who decide who mm. governs the country. It's the people's choice. And I mean, a few years ago, if you asked me this question, I would say, yes, definitely. We'll go on the streets, you know, citizenship, uh, grassroots efforts. You know, we will change the system. We will. But I just don't see how the Lebanese people just with their efforts can put the country, you know, on a better track because we do have such a unique system. You can't really find it in that many countries around the world. So the solution isn't isn't just in the hands of the people. And mm. as you said, the regional dynamics will always, always affect Lebanon. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's it's inevitable. But the thing is that it's the it's the system, and I don't know how it can be changed. I was I've been thinking about this this whole week. How can we change? How can it be changed? Because we all know the system is just not, it's just not working out for us anymore. And however you put it, it just doesn't work. Because if you put in new people, if you demand an independent government, how is that government going to gain confidence in a parliament that's ruled by the um, political parties in power? I mean, it's just... I reach a dead end every time I think about the situation because the people did mobilize and on October 17. They did cause the collapse of the government. That new government came in place and nothing changed. And now there's, you know, talk of a national unity government, which is exactly yeah. the, what yeah. the people were rejecting back in October. Uh -huh. So I just, I don't know how, I don't really have an answer. It's not entirely in the hands of the Lebanese people, unfortunately. So it's not just a matter of votes now. You get a new electoral law, you get uh, parliamentary elections in a few years, that doesn't really offer a way out. That it's sort of, it's far deeper, far more complicated than just voting in a new crowd. Because I, I ask this as, and I know that the answers are complicated, but I, I, try to, I try to look at it in a more simple way, that let's say you got rid of all the usual suspects. And let's say you voted in the most appealing, mm -hmm. um, the most appealing crowd for the parliament. Do you think that that's that's the way out? That it would be them that could actually reconfigure the way Lebanon is governed, and that the bigger problems that have not been solved, and that that includes the STL verdict, which is an, a big, big problem in in modern Lebanon, mm -hmm. that they would then be able to just naturally find a way to heal wounds and maybe rebuild the state. I mean, I'm asking this, and it's almost like a children's book, you know? Uh, is it simply just 128 new names, a new president, a new prime minister, a new speaker, and then we've got it? Or is it even then you'd have the same kind of lingering problems? Well, it will definitely, definitely change a lot of things if we mm. have, if the president and, you know, all of these people you mentioned are a completely new crowd, not 
you know, linked to any sort of establishment mm. party. I, def I mean, if the keys to the country is in the hands, and by keys, I mean state institutions, yes. is in the hands of a new crowd, uh, the government, presidency, parliament, then yes, they do have the power to, you know, enact change. Mm. But then there are the other strings attached. Mm. You have, you know, other powers and other, you know, things that come into play yeah. that will not let them work the way they want to work. But it's definitely, I'm definitely much, it would be much, much better than what we have now. I mean, that that's, is what I think. That's actually a very fair way of saying it, that you'd be able to fix some things, but not, not everything. And mm, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if, yeah, what I said, if all of these state institutions are in the hands of completely people, then they will definitely, it's very realistic to say that if, and if they have the interest of the public, mm. then yes, they will be able to put in new policies and, you know, enact change. But as we know, Lebanon, you know, it's governed by regional and international, uh, you know, powers. So I don't know how it will play out. Well, at least that's a, that's a fair way of ending, I think, a very difficult, uh, it's a difficult topic. And uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate you even offering some perspective. Um, I will say this is the first episode I've done. Somebody in Lebanon, electricity stayed on, the Wi-Fi is up, <laughs> uh, crystal clear. Yeah. I mean, this is Lucky, impressive. Yeah. I think uh, I don't- I'm even surprised. I'm not going to jinx because this. My internet usually lags. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say probably in two minutes it'll all go out. So <laughs> we found that secret spot, the hour that, that everything worked. Uh, you're very kind yeah. to offer these, uh, well, to reflect. And uh, I hope this is your first year only. I, I, I look forward to your, uh, your pieces for many years to come. And the Daily Star seems to be in good hands, despite all the difficulties it's going through. That includes material damage and the economic crisis, and the way media has sort of changed fundamentally. I'm yes. glad that I can still go to the Daily Star and get uh, enough analysis and enough opinion to keep me satisfied. And you're one of those voices well, that I'm I Well, I'm happy to hear to. that. Pushik, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right, this is important to include. Because we already stopped recording and now I'm putting it back in, you know, you, you mentioned that you're not very talkative when you're on the record. But in real life, what did you say? I don't stop. People will just shut me up. They're like, oh my God, you talk so much. And I get, I, if, if we're talking about something that interests me, I will never, it's impossible to shut me up. And I talk fast as well, which was, which again, is not the same when I'm speaking on the record. I'm very, you know. So next time, I just need to be a horrible human being, not tell you that we're recording and just, you know, <laughs> push and just wait. <laughs> I'll get, I'll get five hours of material and then, all right. Oh. Thanks for listening, and a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>